And to remind you, we will be taking questions from these two microphones. We're not passing microphones. And we ask that people keep their questions to questions, not commentaries. And um, at the very end, the authors will be going directly to the signing tent. We have a very quick turnaround. Swan's correcting me. Okay. <laughs> All books for Ben. I'll, I'll just okay. I got it. Okay. I'm going okay. to try it here and then I'll let you know. Yeah, we'll all sign later. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for coming this morning. God, this is a huge crowd. It's kind of crazy. I wanted to sleep in myself. Um, uh, but here I am. Uh, it's actually my AI avatar is here. Um, <laughs> So we, we touched a little bit on AI last night. It's something I've been covering a lot lately. I've covered it for decades, actually, but it's really seen a lot of uh, change, uh, just a lot of hype and a lot of change at the same time. But it's actually quite significant. What's happening now is very similar to any shift that happens in technology, um, such as the graphical user interface, which, which spurred a lot of um, activity. Uh, things like uh, AOL, which spurred more activity. The mobile uh, was another. It was called Web 2.0 or 3.0. I don't know. Um, and 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 now and social media and now this. And this is, I think, in my history of covering tech, the most significant change uh, a, a, that will affect everybody. If you thought the changes have happened quickly, there really are going to, and a lot of money and time is being moved into it. Um, a lot of people thought cyber, um, excuse me, cryptocurrency was going to be the thing, but it's not really. Um, it's turned out to be a bit of a, of a hype cycle, although also important. But what's happening in AI, and especially the companies involved, is a really next phase in, in where we are in the internet. And so I wanted to talk about it with these amazing writers. Mo everyone I know but Rebecca. I don't, I don't, I've never met Rebecca. Uh, I've known Geraldine forever. We worked at the Wall Street Journal together. Obviously, I knew her wonderful husband, Tony. Um, and I think she's an amazing author, but she was also an amazing journalist uh, before that. And she does nonfiction, but uh, her fiction is so stellar. Um, and obviously, Rebecca, I know your work, um, at, 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 at all the different things you do, which bases a lot of your novels are so based in research and, mm -hmm. uh, and journalism. Um, Jacob, I did meet at Slate um, when it started. Uh, I think we met at Microsoft. We were in the Microsoft cafeteria, which was a very exciting place to be. Um, and wow. yeah, remember? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and, uh, and, and he has been one of the earlier uh, people who moved into digital. I think it was him and me and just a very few other people who were very early to digital um, journalism, which everyone thought was going to end everything. Uh, as it turns out, it was Facebook and Google. Um, and then, obviously, Ben, who I think is one of the greatest media writers uh, around um, uh, and has, has done all kinds of different things, written all kinds of books, um, and now has started his own company, uh, Sem4, uh, which is, uh, again, a digital media company. And so they all have a lot to say about creativity, about entrepreneurship, and everything else. Um, but I'd love to get their initial thoughts of what, I have ideas, I'm not gonna say them right now, of what, where we are with AI and where it's going, but I'd love to talk about each of you, your individual, if you could do it briefly, thoughts on what it is to you and how you look at it. Um, Geraldine, why don't we start with you? I'm terrified of it. Okay. Uh, my 27-year-old son, when ChatGPT came out, um, told ChatGPT the title of my forthcoming novel and the place it was set mm -hmm. and task it with writing a review of that novel by Geraldine Brooks. <laughs> I read it. I said to him, delete this. I never want to see it again. I never want anyone else to see it <laughs> because it was stunningly close. So I'm terrified. And I close think in what way? It was very close to the proposal that I, you know, they were yeah. they were reviewing the book I hadn't written yet, and yeah. they were pretty accurate. Okay. <laughs> it's so, not a they. Just so you're aware, AI is not sentient. I'm going to try to. Yeah. I to am everybody. aware of that, but we have a lot of pro problems with pronouns these days. Okay. And, All right. You okay. know, we're, we're grappling. <laughs> Um, Let's just call it, I don't know if you've seen Mission Impossible, but the, the plot is AI is the villain in this oh particular God, I, thing. AI could have written that movie. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. 
but nobody could have jumped There's in. a line in it where they go, the plot thickens. Yeah. 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 Or, you know, we've reached the moment of truth. <laughs> it sounds like chat GPT. Yeah. Okay. I, you know. Okay. Look, All right. if I, if we'll I call had, it the entity, but go if ahead. I, if the entity. If I, were, if, if I were giving career counseling to my kid, I would say the only thing that is safe to be is a comedian or a poet. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Rebecca? Well, I mean, I think we are comedians and poets as well, you know, in what we do. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm actually, I refuse to be pessimistic about this. I refuse to be defeatist about this. I don't think that anyone in this tent wants to read a novel written by a robot. I, I, you know, you, the re, you read either to experience something and go, oh my God, I've experienced that too. I, I, there's this human connection. Or you read to find something that you haven't experienced and you go, oh, that's what life is like over there. As a writer, I write either some combination of deeply personal experience or deeply researched experience. And my job as a writer is to have a vision um, for what that would be, to think about the way that's going to be received, to fine tune. Um, no one wants at least their literary fiction, their poetry, that kind of thing, written by a robot. Maybe romance novels, I don't know, that might be different. Or, you know, I mean, seriously, when you're reading much more, I, I, for just when you're reading for entertainment, for purely for entertainment, when you're reading a thriller that's purely for entertainment, that might be different. Um, what you consume on the screen might be different. Um, but, you know, at the moment, I refuse to be pessimistic. The scary part, of course, is that, you know, have they used our intellectual property to train these things? Yeah, I'll get into that. And, right, so we're, we're concerned about that. And I'm also constantly insulted by people who will say, aren't you so worried about AI stealing your job? And it's like, well, no, you know, you're a lawyer, you should be worried about it. Yeah. You work in tech, you should be worried about it. Yeah, that's What true. do you think exactly I do that can be replaced? And clearly, you know, and it's, it's always coming from people who don't read a lot. So but. essentially the Hunger Games, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You shall prevail. Mm -hmm. Go like this to them, right? Okay, um, Jacob? Thank you, it's very nice to be here. Um, I'm a pu publisher of audiobooks along with podcasts, and I had an idea in December to publish an AI-generated novel, because of course, why not? And you know, I do think there is an element of a Rorschach test with any new technology, but we're seeing particularly with AI, and whatever underlying feelings you have about the world will be expressed around the new technology. If you are fearful and see the dark side, you're gonna see that in spades with this. And if you're fundamentally optimistic and look for opportunity, as I will admit I do. It's a callow outlook on the world. It's very intellectually unsophisticated and lacks credibility. But if you see the world that way, you may look at this technology and say, huh, I wonder what it can do. I wonder if we can do some interesting things with it. And so um, working with a writer named Stephen Marsh, who knows a lot about AI, we created and published a novel called Death of an Author. Uh, and um, I was thrilled with the reviews, which said things like, not halfway bad, <laughs> actually pretty good. That was actually what we were striving for, to see if we could generate something that was sort of like in the ballpark. But in doing that, and I'll talk more about this if people are interested, but I saw more than anything else the limitations of AI with anything mm -hmm. creative. And the biggest limitation is that people want to experience art created by other minds. Yeah. Even if AI can create something entirely passable, it wasn't created by another mind and hence is intrinsically less interesting yeah. to other humans. And I think that's true of writing, I think that's true of art, I think that's true of film and TV. In a way, you didn't, we didn't try to play the game of keeping it secret that our novel was written by AI. But in a way, you want to, because as soon as people find that out, they're bored by it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, it's an amazing turnout and very, very nice to see you all. I mean, I guess as, as sort of a hack journalist who reveres fiction writers and, and I mean, I think I, there's, there, I think there's a huge difference in a huge spectrum. I mean, the notion that, that AI, I mean, I think a lot of what great novels do is sort of answer or engage with kind of questions you didn't know you were asking. I didn't like think that I wanted to, I didn't wake up one morning thinking, you know, I wonder what the AIDS epidemic in Chicago was like. And that's part of what makes the great believers so amazing and moving. And 
but on my end of the spectrum, where it's a lot about gathering information, getting it to you really fast, and and knowing that no one will ever read that piece, that that quick news item that I published two two hours after it was published, that it has an incredibly fast expiry date. I mean, it used to wrap fish, but now like they have better ways of wrapping fish. Um, <laughs> For for a lot of daily journalism, it's incredibly valuable. And, and actually, the thing I think about a lot is that there's there was in the 70s and 80s this shift of journalism being, at least in part, a working class profession where you had people who were great at gathering information and would pick up the phone and say, get me rewrite, which was chat GPT before its time, <laughs> to being a profession populated entirely by people with college degrees who are pretty slick writers, some of whom really aren't that good at thinking or at gathering information. And I think like those skills aren't always evenly distributed. And if and I think there's a democratizing element to all these technologies. I mean, this is an old story too, but whether it's writing or animating, another very expensive thing that mm -hmm. it's, you have to be Disney and have $100 million to make an animated movie, or you did. But if you see everything everywhere all at once, there are seven animators on that movie. And I think it's great that you can produce a movie mm -hmm. like that for less than $100 million. So I think for, I don't know, I think at the at the... At the in a way, like a lot of technologies, at the lower, more practical ends, it's incredibly valuable and democratizing. And, and I don't really see it replacing, you know, Rebecca and Geraldine anytime soon. So I think my job is more at risk, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, indeed. Um, <laughs> so, that, that, so you guys have said a lot of really interesting things. One of the, the things I like when people ask me, because it's what the number one question for people asking me about AI, what's it going to do? Um, first of all, it's been around for a long time, let's be clear. Um, it, what, what's happened is the computing power and other things and, and research is, is it's leaped a little bit, but it's been a relatively slow moving uh, development, um, what's going on. And one of the things I do like to tell people is um, when they get upset about it or they, it's going to kill us, et cetera, et cetera, it is actually not going to kill us necessarily. Um, <laughs> Very reassuring. It, it, it's not. It's, that's not its goal. It's not its aim or anything else. Um, one of the things that I, I like to compare it to, and it's probably an easy one that people get, is um, someone was talking, was angry about it and said, oh, I, this is terrible. This is going to do this. This is going to do that. Um, without understanding how, much, how many jobs and really interesting businesses were created through the internet, which we used mm. to do, right, or, or any of technologies. Um, and I think two, two stories, and then I'd love, I'm love i going to ask you all specific questions and let you talk more, was um, many years ago when my older sons, um, we were walking in Los Angeles, which just in and of itself was a weird thing, um, <laughs> and we happened upon a payphone. And uh, it was broken, obviously, and it hadn't been in use. And my son ran up to it and said, what's this? <laughs> and I said, it's a payphone. <laughs> and they, they said, what's it for? And I said, well, when you went out, you didn't have a phone, and then you would put money in the phone. And, and that's what I was saying. I was like, this is so stupid. Like, this is so dumb. Um, and you put money in the phone, and then you'd call people. People couldn't reach you if you, like, immediately if you weren't near a payphone. And, they, and, they, and I kept trying to explain it, it and it, more and more I was like, this is so dumb. This payphone is so dumb. And, um, and my son looked at me, he goes, Every, everybody use it? And I, can go, I go, yeah, yeah. And he goes, that's filthy. <laughs> Which I thought was true. I was like, it is filthy. Yeah. Um, and I have a picture in front of it where he's going like this, like that, like, which I love, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna use at some point. Um, and I, I remember thinking, you know, he's absolutely right. What happened? And I started to think, what happened to all the people who serviced the payphones, made the payphones, wrote the numbers on the payphone? It was like full of jobs that don't exist anymore. And then they moved over to other jobs. And the second comparison I try to make to people is when someone was talking about it, um, th th they'll say, well, I wouldn't use it. I said, well, and I used, I've used this example many times. I was like, do you use a spreadsheet? You know, a spreadsheet is a piece of software everybody uses now. Nobody doesn't use it. And they're like, well, yeah. And I said, well, you don't use a calculator anymore. And that was a huge business. And you don't use an abacus. That was a huge mm -hmm. business for many, many <laughs> centuries. Um, and then it Big wasn't. Abacus. And now you use the spreadsheet. And because you wouldn't even think of doing it. So this is a spreadsheet for words and for information. And so what you were saying was very true. At the low levels and for research, for example, um, or idea generation, it's very powerful. Give me 10 ideas, or do research, Rebecca, for your book. It will pull in all kinds of stuff. Um, and so in that way, it's really powerful. But what I think, when you were saying, Rebecca, and I love your thoughts, is what happens to creativity, because how creative can it get? 
And my feeling is that very, because I think many people are not creative. You know what I mean? And you can mimic a lot of things. And you not just mimic, but you can take and do patterns mm -hmm. on things. So I'd love you and Rebecca to talk about how you look at creativity and where you get inspiration. Because I think it's very, it's very easy to see patterns, which these mm -hmm. technologies do. Mm -hmm. And they're very good at especially facts. And I know there's problems with facts, but there's problems with facts with people. So mm -hmm. I've sort of been like... Yeah. Okay, you know, I found 10 mistakes in New York Times the other day, so it's fine. But talk about um, uh, that, the idea yeah. of where creativity well, comes. It's like I, the few times I've experimented with it, I've, I've tried using it for research, and almost everything it's given me has been completely wrong. Completely wrong. Um, I, you know, I've asked about myself, it gives the wrong birth year, the wrong birthplace, the wrong college, the wrong, you know, and you go, okay, that, great. I'd, I'd love for this to keep being this inaccurate. Um, <laughs> Uh, as long as it makes me younger and not older, that'd be great. Um, uh, the kind of research that I do for my, you know, when I am writing something that is research dependent is I sit down and talk to people for hours. Mm -hmm. Um, or I'm going through archival... As a like a journalist. Like, right, exactly. Yeah. This right. is not, you know, uh, you know, you mentioned The Great Believers, which is about the AIDS epidemic in Chicago. There was very little in writing about the AIDS epidemic in Chicago. Um, this was, you know, I needed to earn people's trust. I needed to become friends with people. I needed to sit down with them for a very long time. I needed to be reading, you know, old weekly newspapers and things as well. Um, I needed to be walking around uh, what used to be the AIDS unit at this one hospital. I, you know, and I needed to be crying with people, right? I needed to have that kind of that psychological connection. Um, that's nothing that... I've found any help with. Mm -hmm. um, I am writing something historical right now, and I've just out of curiosity, I was like, could it make me a timeline? Because mm -hmm. I'm writing about a real person. Could it make me a timeline of their life? And it included not only wrong dates, but just completely inaccurate facts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely um, just making stuff up. Um, so I, I don't it's trust not, it it's, at it's the moment. It's pulling from at all. databases. That's why it's wrong. You know what I mean? Just well, it seems like it's also putting together sentences. You know, I, I've had, um, I asked it to describe the plot of my, of The Great Believers to me, and it, it's like it took character names, but then just made up completely false plot lines, put people in other roles, so it, it was mm -hmm. like it can make a sentence mm -hmm. out of those components, and mm -hmm. the sentence is grammatical, mm -hmm. but no, that is not, and, and no database out there says that that's what happens in my novel. Mm -hmm. So, um... I mean, I, I would assume that that part is going to get better. At the moment, I would not trust it for any kind of research because mm -hmm. if it can be that wrong about basic things that are available on the internet, I, right? So, the, so what about idea generation? Like, right, I mean, I guess some ideas? people might need that. I have 17 ideas before breakfast. I don't know right. why I would need to. Can I? Yeah. Go ahead, Geraldine. Take it. This is all true for now. I want to take you back with me to Beersheba in Israel in 1988. Mm -hmm. And I was interviewing a scientist at the university there. And he said to me, well, as I was saying to my Jordanian colleague this morning, and I said, what? Because in those days, there was no communication between Israel and Jordan. And he said, oh, yeah, no, I'll show you. And he types mm -hmm. and a line of green FTP. text. Mm -hmm. And that was the internet before HTML, before mm -hmm. the World Wide Web. And I thought, yep. this is fantastic. But it was a line of green text. We're at the line of green text yeah. stage. Yeah. These Very machines, when they backwards. have absorbed everything that we know, you think, you know, um, Tolkien stole from Shakespeare. Shakespeare stole from the Bible. All creativity is built on somebody else's creativity. <laughs> And it's a synthesis. And that's why I think um, this thing is going to be powerful. It's going to be beautiful. It will never be human, but it might be something else that we find completely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me, let me, I'll, I'll check yeah. just a second. When that happened, that's hap that happened to me too. That happened several times to me. And if you do go back and look at early internet, you'll laugh. You'll, you'll think mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. Like an early Yahoo, early Amazon, early Google. Google looks the same. Um, but, do, you, um, do you remember Alta Vista? Of oh, yeah. <laughs> what it would bring you? It would bring you elephants when you asked for giraffes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I remember all of them, in fact. Um, and one of the things that was, you know, as I'm writing the memoir I'm writing right now, which is finished last night. Um, um, wow, congrats. Uh, thanks. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, last night? 
Yeah. Well, I finished it, but then I re read it through again and sent it off and said, see you the fuck later. Um, uh, I, I was recalling the very, I was reading through the parts about the early internet and, um, and the, the, the very first pictures on, on the World Wide Web were pictures of coffee brewing at MIT, um, which was riveting. That's all they could point the camera to, and that was it. And I was, it was funny, but then I was like, I remember watching that quite a bit. Um, and finding it fascinating and yeah. thinking, and then is that all there is? And then, of course, we couldn't have anticipated mm -hmm. any of it, any of it. Like it, with mobile, you couldn't have anticipated. Uber, you couldn't have anticipated. You could have, but you couldn't have, right? And so that's where I'm, go ahead, Jacob. Well, I was just gonna say, some of the basic limitations of AI, at least the versions we're working with now, are tremendous. It has no reason. It does not know the difference between truth and falsehood. It can't do simple arithmetic, and of course, it lacks consciousness. And the current path that that's AI- That's true for a lot of us. I know, that's right. <laughs> it's it's really like, depends and... how early in the morning. We've all had our coffee. You, you uh, literally yeah. just named 50% of the yeah. journalists okay. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and we take pride in that. But um, it's not on a path to be able to do any of those things, because large language models, at least as I understand the technology, which is a lay person's understanding of it, um, which with uh, predictive statistical text, it doesn't get over any of those hurdles. Now, there are some people think, well, if it gets big enough, it will be able to simulate those things very effectively. But I, I see those limitations as a pretty, pretty firm ceiling on what we're dealing with at the moment. Let's talk about what it can do. It is tremendous in terms of playing with literary style. Um, and I understand if you're an author, you don't necessarily want it playing with your style or your text. And we can, we can talk about that in a minute. But just as a pure tool, it's astonishing. So one of the programs I worked with in creating this novel is called PseudoWrite, which is essentially a chat GBT based style engine. And you can give pseudo write any piece of please public domain text. You can give it Obama's first inaugural, you can give it the instructions to a coffee maker, and say, please put this in the style of Henry James. Yeah. And it will generate mm -hmm. a spectacular parody. And you can say, please put it in the style of late Henry James, and it will do that. And you can say, write it in the style of Ulysses by James Joyce. And it will do that. And it can do, and you can then give it say, I want to have these 20 different influences all reflected stylistically in this piece of text, and it will do all of them. And so it's this paradox that there are basic things that AI can't do to save its life, like, you know, know which way is up or what the year you were born. Um, but there are things that are really beyond maybe any but the, you know, most sophisticated literary minds in terms of like pulling in massive. Jacob, as a media company, what do you hope it will do? Save money? Do, do, what is the, what, when you jumped into it, and I have done the same thing, what do you imagine it will do? Innova innovation, in the sense of we don't know what it will do. We want to see what it can do. Um, but I guess the question is, by playing around with it, are you doing something dangerous or threatening? And certainly a lot of people, including some people at our own company, felt that way. I mean, when, when I had the idea to do this, I thought, well, we'd like to get a printed version of this. Mm -hmm. And I talked to a number of book publishers. And honestly, even the bravest publishers I know were afraid to publish something in AI mm -hmm. because it's considered so toxic by mm -hmm. the writing community. And I guess Because my publishers love authors so much. I mean. <laughs> They're, at the end of the day, they have a constituency and there's a politics to it. And yeah. they don't, they don't want to piss off all of their authors. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I was just reading through the yeah. Simon and Schuster case with the Justice <laughs> Department, so I feel like yeah. they don't like authors. Yeah. But well, I'm ahead. sort of okay with pissing off authors. But, yeah. um, but so, I, I, you know, but my, my feeling is this is a new thing. Let's not do anything dangerous, but let's play with it. And it's the same way I felt when we were starting on the internet in 1996. Mm -hmm. We don't really know. It's a new tool. A lot of interesting things are going to come out of it. Resistance is probably futile in the sense yes, that if you don't, you know, if so you don't I, learn I'd love you, and then well. I want to get yeah. uh, Ben's ideas about the journalistic aspects of it, but recall for them what it was when you and I started writing. People, when I put an email on the bottom of my stories in the Washington Post, I literally had almost the whole newsroom saying, why are you doing that? And I said, well, readers will talk to me. And they say, why do you want that? And I was like, because I want read, I think readers are going to be part of the relationship now. And every, there's going to be 
you know, journalism done by others, and, and they're like, why would you want that? And I was like, because you suck, but, and they're good, or maybe they're not good. I don't know where talent is. Talk about what it was like when that was happening, because there was huge resistance from print people that exist, don't exist now. I guess there's no such thing as print versus anything else. But there was huge resistance to pushing back and pushing back. It's a recurring cycle. I mean, Ben's lived through multiple versions of this, too. It starts with, that's ridiculous. No one would ever want that. To, oh, my God, it's going to put us all out of work and take <laughs> over everything. To, uh, we're really, although we thought you were crazy to do that, we're not really envious that you've, you've done it and it's too late for us. To, uh, it's over, nobody cares about it, it didn't work, you know, please turn off the lights when you're done, and then you start over. Yeah. And with that happened with the internet, I mean, at least, there have been at least two full cycles with the at internet. Least. And I have to think we're going through, and actually, I think about maybe 10 to 13 days ago, we all got bored with AI. Mm -hmm. Like, we, it went from the only thing anybody was talking about to when you bring it up or someone brings it up, the eyes kind of roll because everyone's so like which is over the, it. Which is the scary time. Yeah. At the, when I came to the journal to cover the internet, I was their first internet reporter. And a very prominent media reporter who's now Mr. Internet, and I'm not going to say who it is, but <laughs> he's Mr. Internet. It wasn't you. Um, <laughs> you liked it right away. Told me it was CB radio. Um, <laughs> And I was like, it's going to decimate your entire industry and all those ridiculous moguls you cover. And it was like kind of an ugly situation at the Journal. But go, go ahead, Bren. Talk about the, the effects on journalism itself. Because, you know, journalists produce books from a lot of their reporting, and everything is already out there already. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they are ultimately their language. This, this iteration of AI that we're talking about are language models. Um, and they actually, they can work with things other than language, but uh, most of what we're talking about is, is language. Well, and the so, imagery stuff is interesting, yeah. too. Yeah. And the, you know, medical research medical and stuff. Medical is amazing. Um, but it does, it sort of, I mean, I guess I feel like all these iterations sort of make you think about, okay, like, what is your job? Because like, mm -hmm. I think for a, lot, for a lot of journalists, the job was for a lot of people to produce you know, six or 12 or 18 inches of copy mm -hmm. that would go into a slot in a industrial production of a newspaper the next day. And I think, you know, for the reporters like Kara and you know, others who, who got on early, it was like, oh no, the job is to find interesting stuff that people want to talk about and it doesn't, and, and get it to them. And, and the internet sort of freed individual reporters from this industrial production process. And I think with I, I, but I still think for, and I think this is actually just a lesser degree true of other kinds of writers that people who don't who aren't in that world think oh your job is to write but actually most of what writers do is not sit and just write from you know free association all day it's to do research and to um and you know and, and to gather facts integrate and and yeah and so i think like from from, from my perspective it's lo just trying to think about how do you how do you sp get your reporters you know i have uh, 30 reporters working for me to spend or 20 to spend all of their time doing the stuff that ai can't do like last week getting leaked signal messages from Ron DeSantis' campaign. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I want them spending. I want them spending 100% of the time doing that. And mm -hmm. if that means, if, that, if they can ask some tool to go write, the, write it up, like great. Mm -hmm. Like that's so secondary to mm -hmm. the, in my, at least in my corner of the world, like the mm -hmm. core work of gathering information. But you're also an author. How does it affect you as an author? Uh, that's a big one. Well, mm -hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really, I, I, don't, I think I haven't quite... I don't quite associate with that word, author. But when you start, you have, you have I, no. But for me, the fun part of the book was all right. Hack the it's fine. was the I'll take yeah was, was was again like the figuring out what had happened and going back and asking people questions and doing research, and again maybe it's a little bit about how you think of yourself. And this probably is not going to make anybody want to to read my book. But mm -hmm. I that but to me it was like the figuring out what had happened that was so interesting. And I hated the writing. Mm -hmm. And if somebody had said, here's a machine that'll do the writing for you, I would have said, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So but d d in terms of jobs, because one of the things is jobs. As you, is, This is something that's in the middle of the writer's strike right now. And the and SAG is the use of imagery, the use yeah, of and their face. And, just, and I, I have a very specific, I mean, because I'm building a newsroom right now. Mm -hmm. The last newsroom I ran, we had copy editors. Mm -hmm. We don't have copy editors because you can drop a story into ChatGPT and say, can you point out any typos and deviations from AP style? And it does a great job. Mm -hmm. And so that is that really does eliminate a job that had been under pressure for years, copy mm -hmm. editing. Grammarly had already done a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, I think it will really, as you say, eliminate a lot of jobs, but really on the production side of newsrooms. Right, it, ma making of things. 
as, as, as fiction how do you feel about that with publishing changing? Because I have found that most in my, the reason I hadn't written a book in 25 years, I wrote two books and then I didn't, and I got approached a lot. And I found the entire, uh, the entire industry so antiquated, I, I wanted to like put on my spats and sit with them, right? <laughs> and I was in the room with, at one point, and the AOL book, AOL had bought Time Warner. And, and I, was, um, I was sitting with them and I was like, well, I have the only book on these people, like who just bought the biggest media company in the world. And they said, well, it's going to be hard to get that book out. To, I'm like, get, uh, you know, h hundreds of books to New York across the street from Time Warner. Mm -hmm. They want to know who these absolute idiots are. And I'm going to explain it to them. And they're like, yeah, you know, a lot of the books are in Kansas City, uh, in bookstores. And a lot of the books are here. And I'm like, why the fuck are they there? Why are they there? Why, why didn't you just find out where people were searching for them on the Internet and then put them only in the stores where people are interested. And let's ignore Kansas City because they weren't interested in my book. They sold three books there or whatever. Not to say, well, whatever. I didn't want anyone in Kansas City to buy it. But fine, if they did, if they could order it on Amazon. And I used to sit there, and this is probably why the publishers didn't want me back. And I, would, I had an exercise where I said, I'd go there, and then they'd blah, 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 blah. And there's a lot of people. And I was like, I don't know what you're doing, but you're not helping me. You're not editing. You're not doing this. You're not, like... I had more editing in a story in the Wall Street Journal than I did mm. for my second book, I think. Um, and I said, let's play this game that they play in Silicon Valley of um, it's vampire or wolf, whatever it's called, um, uh, where everybody in the room, except for two people, have to die um, to create <laughs> this book. And I said, you, editor, you didn't do much editing. I don't need you. Publicist, I could hire one. You, printer, I could get it on demand. Yeah. Uh, I said, and I went through everyone in the room, and everyone was dead except for me and Jeff Bezos. I had to pretend Jeff Bezos. <laughs> <laughs> and Walmart, I think I let Walmart live. Walmart slash Jeff Bezos, and they were like, "Ha!" Ah. I'm like, "No, really, I don't need you at all. Like, I don't know why I need you." And so, talk a little bit about what. <laughs> so you're self-publishing your memoir? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But I just, I just got so bothered by them, they, they, and they, they handed me a pile of money, I'll be honest with you, and that was what did it. Um, <laughs> and um, what do you need your publishers for? Yeah. So talk about what, what, what you need. And I, I, by the way, I like, I love John Carp, I love my publishers, they're very nice, but um, I, I still have, I'm uncomfortable with their presence, but go ahead. Can. I can, no, I can, I can absolutely answer okay. that. Um, here's the thing, so first of all, they are curators, right? Mm -hmm. There are something, you know, there are two million self-published books a year. Maybe, you know, once in a blue moon, one of them busts out and people discover it, or there's certain, you know, serialized dragon fantasy stuff that people, you know, people buy that. Um, for the most part, the books that you know, that you found, they are published, booksellers, you know, you need that curation process. Mm -hmm. I need to know that if I buy a book from Knopf, if I buy a book, you know, that says something. Um, that is, you know, I teach a lot of writing. I see a lot of amateur writing. There is a lot of writing out there. And for some people, self-publishing is the thing. You've written a family mm -hmm. history. You've written... I once, I saw this book, this woman had written a guide to the bakeries of southern Wisconsin, and it was called, Don't Stop Me Now, I'm On a Roll. <laughs> um, and the cover was her sitting on a big dinner roll. Available, it was amazing. Available on Amazon, but go ahead. <laughs> that's it. Right, so no, that, that's a perfect self-published book, right? Um, she's going to find her own readers. She knows how to to get to the bakeries of southern Wisconsin, which is her, her constituency. Um, but you walk into a bookstore, there, there has to be this sieve, there has to be this filtration process. Certainly, it probably keeps some good books out, it's not perfect, but otherwise, it's gonna be chaos. You're gonna have three million books and how do you know what you're choosing? So my, you know, I have had amazing editors who have, you know, redirected the shape of the book, come in like a chiropractor. Um, little edits like, you know, and this is my editor, not my copy editor, on my most recent book, um, I was talking about a teenager and I said something about lipstick and her note was, no, 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 it would be lip gloss. And I was like, oh, she's absolutely right. It's 1995, this kid is wearing lip gloss, right? These little, very human things, right? And it's not something I would catch myself. Every writer needs an editor, just like an athlete needs a coach, an actor needs a director. Um, then publicity, my God, I would, uh, you know, the, the publicity department there, it's not hiring an independent publicist. They know the bookstores. They know the festivals. They know the tour spots. They, the marketing team, everyone's working together. I've had a really good experience. Plenty of people have had bad mm -hmm. experiences. There's no way 
um, first of all, that I could do that myself, or that you know, if I had to hire people, I'd be having to hire 17 people to, okay, who, you know, and how do you hire someone who then knows Terry Gross, mm -hmm. hire someone who knows Seth Meyers, hire, right? Um, and then the copy editing, I mean, the, the tiny fact-checking, the tiny just, you know, so you, you used this word three pages ago. I would be absolutely lost. I do, th you know, what I say to students who are interested in self-publishing is, you know, if it's the, it, you know, if, if you're comfortable, literally, you know, you're going to sell, you think about in your head who you can personally sell a book to, and maybe that's a lot of people because you're famous, maybe that's a few people because you have friends, but that's how many books you will sell, right? You think I can hand sell 20 books, you're going to sell 20 books. And if that's the right thing for people, that's great. But at this point in time, and, and self-publishing has been around for, I mean, really forever, but in, in its current iteration mm -hmm. for a good 20 years, mm -hmm. um, the wave of the future of everyone's going to self-publish everything, it hasn't happened, and it hasn't happened for a reason. Okay. So. I, uh, I agree with everything you've said, but we, we're very lucky writers. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. It's fallen the right way for us. Um, I would also, big shout out to independent booksellers who yeah. put our, yes. our kind of books yes. yeah. into the hands yeah. of the readers who are ready to receive them without independent bookstores. I'm sorry, Amazon's not going to do it. No, I would agree. Independent yeah. bookstores. But, but my, my concern is different. My concern is the contract that I signed a year ago, which will mm -hmm. cover my income mm -hmm. and, and my kids' tuition yeah. <laughs> for the next five years, probably, because that's how long it will take me to write the two books that I contracted for. And there's nothing in it about AI. I am completely unprotected. Mm -hmm. And the publishers are just not on it. And we should be on strike. We mm -hmm. should be out there on picket lines because it's desperate. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And what, do you, what, what are you worried about? I'm worried about, um, with this with no language protecting me, anyone can take anything that I write and mm -hmm. form a derivative of it that can be totally close to it, and where's the copyright protection for me? I'd love you two to write now. We're gonna get questions from the audience. What time do we have? We're at 10.25. 10.25, all right, I'm gonna get some quick questions from the audience, but how do you look at copyright? Because that was the last thing I wanna talk about, because one of the protections against these LLMs and the stuff that they're scraping, because they scrape the first part of the internet, now they're really going deep deep, deep into under the subdermis. Um, how do you look at copyright? Because some people, like I just was talking to uh, people at the Times, to Barry Diller, many publishers are starting to unite to try to protect um, copyright. And that was how YouTube got ultimately sued and not really, they didn't really lose, but it, there, there were the payment systems that went into uh, stuff that's on there. At the same time, there's never been more creators. I don't. I would push back. You spend a minute on TikTok. Maybe there's a million of them. One percent of them are fantastic, and we're undiscovered by this group of people on the Upper East Side of New York, right? I, there is there is a discovery situation. I mean, look at New York. There was a riot yesterday. Of a guy I'm sure none of you have ever heard of. He's an in, in influencer because he's so popular, um, and and he reaches people in ways the regular system doesn't. Um, at the same time, algorithms also are pretty great the way they reach you when you're on Netflix or anything else. It does know, start to know you and understand what you like. Um, so talk about copyright and the algorithm in terms of getting that to you. Yeah, so um, th I'm not sure your publisher can protect you. That's the problem. I yeah. think what's the thing that is being done that is wrong is ingesting copyrighted materials for training AIs without permission from the copyright holders. And this happened before, all this happened before. Remember Google Book? Oh, I they, remember. Google Book said, won't it be great, we'll scan all of the content of the world's libraries and everything will be in there. And we're not selling it, we're just gonna, we're just gonna yeah. scan it so we have it. Yeah. And the authors, I can't remember if it was the Authors Guild, or the authors protested and said, hey, we didn't give you permission to do that. And there was a court case, if I remember correctly, and Google lost yeah. and had to stop doing that. They were now, also taping all of television. I have a scene in my book where Larry's like, why can't I tape all of television? And I was like, you don't own it. I mean, <laughs> and I was like, robot, there were, you can't there do were, it. There were, you know, positive things that could have come out of that. I mean, for example, 
Um, people who are visually impaired had a very, very limited ac access to a very limited That's right. number of audio books at that point. And Google, as part of that, was there was technology uh, invented by uh, Alan Kurzweil, if I remember, that basically mm -hmm. can do text to speech. And people who are visually impaired can have books read to them. That would have been a good thing. But Google didn't have permission to do this. And people um, creating uh, scanning stuff for training materials have been up to this point just doing it in this cowboy fashion. And I absolutely am in favor of authors, publishers saying, we own this stuff. You can't do this unless you pay it based on an agreement. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think that's going? Um, well, first, I hope somebody wrote down what Geraldine said, because mm -hmm. I feel like I want to quote her, and that was super okay. interesting. So you're going to quote um, her back what she just said. Go ahead. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I guess I think publishers and, and all sorts of creators feel that they were incredibly naive with social media, gave everything away, all of the internet. lost out, are sort of girding for a huge fight now. And, you know, and, and, and the AI companies, I think, similarly don't want to be at war with they the don't. publishers. And, and, they're, and, and they're saying the right words, and everyone is sort of aligning around the idea of a settlement. But the problem is that the... AI companies look at what Facebook did, which was to throw like a few bucks in the direction of publishers, buy their silence, calm them down eventually, and they, yeah, that's cool. Like we can spend a, we can spend two hundred million dollars on this. That is right. Barry Diller is like, what about twenty million dollars? And there's a huge twenty billion, sorry, and there's a huge gap, like two orders of magnitude there. And I think the, the underlying thing is that the last generation of tech companies is used to having basically no content cost and profit margin and massive, massive profit margins. Yep. And people like Barry Diller are used to the cable business. Where if you if you run if you own, if you're Comcast, you own the cable wires, mm -hmm. it's a good business, but you're paying most of most of the money you take in, you're paying back out to ESPN and CNN and people like that. Or Spotify. And you're if you're Spotify, right? Like these just aren't as good businesses. And I think the AI companies want to be a business like Google which just keeps all the money and runs a socialist mini state for its employees. Mm -hmm. not, a, not a business like Spotify, which is totally dominated by the record labels and manages to eke out tiny profits in, on a good year. Yeah. And that's a huge difference. And, and I think and a huge amount of money at stake. And for all that they are sort of all saying the same words, I think they're not even really in the same ballpark at all. No, and there's going to be a huge fight about this. All right, we have time for two very quick questions right here. Hi, my name is Meg, and I'm the associate head of school at Georgetown Day School. Oh, my kid. What, what do we say to the children? And in two weeks, what do I say to our teachers who are trying to figure out how to wrap their minds around teaching literature, um, studying history, and AI? So I would love to hear any wow. advice you can give us on returning to school with this so dominant. It still is dom. It hasn't died. In no, 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 yet. no, not at all. Not with young people. I think not ignoring it and start using it with them. You know, I think that's one of the things. I think one of the problems with the media it suddenly was like, college essays, they're cheating on them. I'm like, people have been cheating for di centuries. Like, <laughs> it's just another tool. I think involving yourself with them, using it, and talking about it is the best thing instead of pretending it's not there. Right, and I think that's part of it. And the other part of it, really learning about it with them, because I think kids are a lot smarter than you imagine on these topics, and do understand what it's doing. That would be my advice. Anybody else? See, my husband's a high school English teacher. Um, one of the things you know, you were pointing out, there, there, there's bad writing that sounds like AI, right? Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> you can, you can actually, what teachers can do now, they can they scan an entire essay into this thing, and it'll tell you the likelihood that certain parts were written by AI, and it's actually very accurate. Um, my husband, what he's planning to do with his seniors is have them try to write like an AI, try to write a sentence that the machine will come back and say, yes, this was written by AI, as an exercise in how yeah. not to write, yeah. right? <laughs> William Shakespeare wrote many plays. They have great historical significance. It's going to come back and say, this was written by AI. I don't write like that. Yeah. Let's be yeah. better. I think using it, using it and not being scared of it and going, oh my God, or assuming your kid's are cheaters and suck. I, I just don't see why. And I hope you don't do that. My two kids went there, so. <laughs> and by the way, they're very good writers, except sometimes. Um, Thank you. So anyway, uh, one, more, and one more question right here. I have a super quick question. I'm kind of pivoting off of something that Rebecca said earlier, which is that AI got her facts wrong. Um, mm -hmm. What about the nefarious implications yeah. of AI. Um, I know that truth is something that doesn't exist anymore, but I worry about how it can be, um, because it's so powerful. Um, I just worry about the nefarious 
implications that we have with AI. Yeah, it's a fantastic weapon. I don't know what else to say it is. It can be used just the way, listen, Photoshop is a fantastic weapon, all kinds of technologies. And so are, you know, as I said last night, Hitler didn't need Instagram. He managed to do it just the old-fashioned way, you know. And so I, I think one of the things you have to be aware of is the provenance of where things are coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's being worked on, actually. And there's a lot of legislation around provenance and where this stuff comes from. There's an old saying in tech, and I, Jacob, I may have gotten this wrong. I think it's basically crap in, crap out, right? And so if you have terrible databases and terrible information, you will get that out. But I don't know if anybody else... That's another reason we need publishers, right? Is if anyone can put an AI in and write a false history of World War II, I want the one that is actually coming from Norton or whatever that has been vetted. I need to know where that's coming from. Yeah. But the, the only solution is for the platforms to assume the responsibilities of right. publishers. So if Facebook and Google say, thank you, um, Section 230, we legally are not liable. For, it's just a platform. People put stuff up. That's how we've gotten to this point. That is right. And what, the, what they need to do with AI is say, we're going to take responsibility for labeling it so people mm -hmm. know what it is. And we have the technology to de detect the fakes. But if okay. they, the previous president is not doing that. And, and I think when, I mean, a, a lot of this will play out around the presidential That's campaign. Okay. That's okay. Oh, sorry, do you want to? Sorry, go ahead. And, and, and I think, you know, if you see a video of Joe Biden falling off the stage, actually a lot of people already are pretty sophisticated that this might be fake and there are a lot of deep fakes out there. And I think we have a lot of actually antibodies about a fake video and saying, ah, that doesn't look quite right. And, I, and in some ways, I think the risk is, is the reverse, that every video you see, if you see a video of Joe Biden falling off the stage, you're going to assume it's fake. Mm -hmm. And his staff might say it's fake, and maybe it won't be fake. And I think that's, <laughs> and I think in, oh, in, I, and, Hunter and, Biden's and, laptop and I think comes if to you mind. See, I think if you see the, yeah, and I think if you, mm -hmm. if you think about how those, the, those Donald Trump recordings of him saying disgusting stuff last cycle, I, he would have said, that's manipulated. I never said that. And would yeah. you have been sure? I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good point. Anyway, those are all excellent points. You have more questions for everybody. This is an evolving topic. Um, so, and thank you. We'll see where we go. Thank you so much, all of you. Before we thank.